Our first subject this morning is how to find total healing. Now, let us examine what is meant by total healing. So many people today who are students of biology seem to feel that the envelope of the skin containing this sack of bones, which we call our body, is all of us. And that there, as some little boy might say, ain't any more. We who are students of metaphysics and of the Ascended Master's teachings are well aware that there is a great deal more. Now, medical science and science itself, without question, mind you, will admit to the existence of the mind. But if you ask them to explain this mind and this wonderful consciousness, about all they can do is give you an engineer's description. They can tell you how the trunks of the nerves reach up into the cerebellum and cerebrum. They can talk to you about the dura mater and the pia mater of the brain. They can tell you how the motor and sensory nerves send forth their responses and the body moves and how we think to a degree. But if you ask them, what do we think with? They probably will take you back to the brain and say you think with a brain and so forth. Well, we know that consciousness is not just the body. And we must understand that. But they would have us believe that all things are in the body and that there is nothing that exists outside of the body. In fact, they are somewhat disturbed today by ESP, or extrasensory perception. However, they have found a very logical explanation for ESP also. They have decided that brain waves and so forth can travel a long distance as television, pictures, and radio waves and signals do. Now, you may wonder how I'm relating this to healing. Well, first of all, in order to find total healing, we know that we have to go back to the cause of the disease. Now, they hold that the cause of disease is resident within the physical body, that something is wrong. But why is something wrong? Why did this beautiful machine, which functions so well in millions and billions of people, enabling them to live not only to three score and ten, but also to live to 110 and more. Why does it go wrong in some people in infancy? Why does something go wrong? Well, they tell us that it's because of abuses. And so in examining oldsters, we often find that some of the older people tell us, well, I never drank any spirituous liquor, and I did not smoke, or I was a vegetarian all of my life, and that's why I'm so old. Another man will say, I'm like Will Rogers. I never met a man I didn't like. And that's why I'm so old. Well, what is the real answer behind this? Other men will come out and say, well, I've drank all my life. I'm 107 and I've married my fifth wife, wore them all out, and I smoke like a chimney. And I'm perfectly all right. My stomach's good. My nerves are good. My heart's good. I'm in good shape. Well, if you're going to go by the standard of this fellow, you're going to really carry on. You see what I mean? So, beloved Master Moria L. has suggested many times that physicians should examine well people instead of sick people to see what keeps them well or what makes them well. Now, in that connection this morning, let us examine well people. First of all, it says in Genesis that the Lord God created man in his own image. Most of us have always taken it for granted, at least I have, that the physical body was the image of God. That is years ago. Of course, as I grew a little older and 
I hope a little wiser, and as I contacted the masters in a greater degree, I became increasingly aware of the fact that the body of man was not the image of God in any sense of the word. And as I started to go to the zoo and then began traveling in the larger cities and meeting many people, I decided that it definitely was not the image of God. I'm sure that you have had this experience of meeting people that are so weary in their physical appearance. Probably when you came in here the first time and saw me, that was one of the occasions. Anyhow, you have seen people on the street that are very, very weary. Now, I would rather not give you the description of one woman I saw with a little girl one time, and they were both alike, because I don't wish to haunt you with this. But certainly, all of us have at one time or another seen enough to be convinced that man is not the image of God in the flesh form, and if he were, we would all look alike, would we not? At least we'd be as good-looking as one another. And certainly, we realize that all people are not prima donnas and movie stars and whatnot. So then, being convinced that the image of God is not the flesh form, we can understand that it is a body temple or a coat of skins which holds the immortal spirit of man or the spirit of life. Now, why does this body temple go bad? Why do things go wrong with the valves of the heart? Medical science, of course, has its own answers. They say excess cholesterol gets in the arteries, puts a strain on the heart. But why, and I ask you this question, do we find one well person with millions of well people, billions of them, why do we have some people that are well who eat the same things that the others do and the cholesterol does not collect in their arteries as it does in others? and their arteries do not clog up. These are the things you have to try to understand. And therefore, we must, if we are to be honorable about this, recognize that the cause of disease is not in the physical body alone. I do not deny, and I think we would be foolish to do so, that we can get a thorn in the flesh. I do not mean to deny that we can have things happen to our physical body. We can take poison in food that we're eating, and many of us do because of sprays and various things that are in the atmosphere. But I'm not talking about extraneous matter. I'm talking about the causes of disease that seem to be the effect of something else than something we actually take in. Because all people may live in the same area and take in the same radioactivity. They may take in the same kinds of food. And yet some of these people will have these problems with cholesterol, whereas other people at the age of 90 are still going strong and their arteries are very flexible and pliable. We cannot say, and medical science certainly cannot prove, that it is because one man had proper medical attention. And the AMA cannot say that this man, John Doe, has had the best of medical care and Pete Smith over here has not, because in many cases, people have had the same care, and one is well and the other one is sick. And they've had the same disease at one time or another. And one has recovered and gone on to be 90 years old, whereas the other one has passed on from the disease. That's what I'm trying to convey to you this morning. So the doctors have no real basis, in fact, for many of their statements that they make. Now, I don't wish to imply that I do not support doctors I recognize that the science of chiropractic is of great benefit. I recognize that osteopathy is of great benefit. I realize that some surgical procedures appear to be necessary, particularly in accident cases. I recognize that medical science has done many wonderful things, but they are not a panacea for all of our ills. If they were, we would cheat the undertaker completely and they'd go out of business. And a great deal of the illness in the world today plagues the younger generation as well as the older people. You take muscular dystrophy, infantile paralysis, and many of your other diseases which have not been completely licked, although we have made significant progress in it. Come back now. 
and let's see if we can find out what the real causes of disease are. We all admit we have a mind, at least we know we think. Ask somebody where they think and they will say, well, I certainly don't think in my big toe. We think somewhere else, don't we? And we think we think up here in our brain. But actually, I suppose that our thought process is in the soul, which science says we do not have. That is, they say they've never been able to find the soul. They admit that when people pass on or change their garments, that something has stopped. They know the heart stops beating. They know the person is not conscious. They know they're laying there inanimate and do not move. But they do not know what it is that has gone out. They say, well, the heart stopped and they quit breathing and therefore they've expired. But they have not examined the real causes of these conditions from the standpoint of metaphysics because most of the physicians today, with a few exceptions, deny metaphysics. They may affirm some particular orthodox faith and attend church, but very few of them uh, in the younger generation actually have a deep and abiding faith in God. Oh, I admit that there are exceptions to this rule and there are very splendid physicians, but these exceptions certainly do not prove the rule or anything else because most of them are the other way around. They are a little inclined to depend on outer world science for everything and for their healing. Now. The real key to this lies in the four lower bodies of man. We have the physical body, and it is porous. We've got pores. This physical body is like a sponge. You can take a sponge and dip it in water, and it will hold a great deal of water according to its capacity. The physical body is actually a bundle of emotions is also uh, filled with a mental body which interpenetrates the physical flesh form and has an etheric or memory body. Your soul is your own individual identity of consciousness to me. That's how I think of it. Here is your God presence individualized. Here is your causal body. Here is your Holy Christ self. Here is your silver cord of energy coming down from God that beats your heart and your physical body. Here's your threefold flame. I contend, of course, that there is a definite separation insofar as interpenetration goes of the God presence. The God presence is located from 7 to 70 feet above your head and at perhaps a 45 degree angle. If you were to close your eyes and then open them, it would be about at this angle above you. Now, the God presence sometimes descends very close and can envelop the physical form. And this, of course, is perhaps one of the best ways of achieving total healing because when the God presence comes down and descends or the Holy Christ self ascends up into it and the physical ascends up into the Holy Christ self, you have a complete integration. But it can be done another way. The God presence can descend down and envelop the Holy Christ self or higher mental body. Then the Holy Christ self or higher mental body can come down and envelop or overshadow the human flesh form. This, of course, would bring about complete integration and the tremendous electronic waves that would come about through this process would produce almost instantaneous healing of any physical ill because it would create the proper flux pattern in the electronic components that make up the body. In other words, all uh, distortions of disease in the physical flesh form will create a certain pattern, which is a disease pattern. It is usually erratic. If there were a means of putting an oscilloscope on people so you could actually see what is vibrating in different parts of the body and turning buttons so you could bring in the liver and the spleen and all these things, and get the pattern, you would see that there are distortions in people who are unwell, but you would see a very definite pattern of wholeness in people who are well. Well, the presence coming down would just cause everything to line up, you see. And when you've corrected the cause of illness in the electronic body of man, and I'm referring not to the 
this electronic body up here. Now I'm talking about the electronic framework that causes the physical body itself to take on its own patterns. I, I want to distinguish this. I hope I'm not being too technical for anyone. In other words, you know there's something that causes the cells to remain what they are and to have their own identity. I'm referring now to the fingernail cells. The fingernail cells remain fingernail cells. They don't produce something else. I smashed a finger here a while ago and it was a very interesting thing to find out how the nail kept on and on and on and replaced itself and built a new nail right under the old one and then pushed the other one off the top. Well, the cells went into that, you see, and kept on building fingernail. It would be just too bad if they started to build an eyeball or something down here. You know what I mean. It's a very good thing that everything works in a proper manner. Now, what I'm trying to lead up to here is to show you that it would be possible for a necrosis of the cells to take place, whereby the cell would lose all of its identity and it would just actually go back to a mere protoplasm, you might say, without any individual identity. And therefore, you have to realize there is an electronic germ or pattern that's behind every part of your body. And I believe that the cause of disease is because of disturbances in your thoughts. In other words, you think wrong and you feel wrong, disturbances in your emotion, which communicate itself to the electronic pattern behind the individual body parts. And I believe that the secret behind healings, which are called divine healings by men such as Oral Roberts, is that Somehow or other, in his prayer life and attunement with God, this man has reached a point where he is able to convey the vibratory action of the Divine Presence and the Holy Spirit through to these people so that they contact their own God Presence and that the God Presence comes down and gives them total healing. But it usually lasts, in some cases, for only a short time or in other cases it may last permanently but all cases do not last forever. I mean, they don't last as long as the people do. A lot of times these people get sick again with something else or they get the same thing back, but you don't hear about that. And a lot of these conditions are, of course, the type of conditions that can change from time to time. So that we have to examine, if we wanted to examine these cases, all individually and you can't examine them collectively. But I'm not interested in getting into that aspect of it. I merely mention that in passing because a lot of people are aware of the healing work that many people engage in through prayer and prayer alone. Now I would like to find total healing for myself if I had anything wrong with me. And I would not like to have that healing last just for maybe a couple of hours or maybe a few days or a few weeks and then have the condition worsen. Jesus himself said to people when he healed them, he said, now go and sin no more, lest the worst thing come upon thee. And so I want to point out that I believe that what he referred to as the sin there is the negative thoughts that they engaged in. It had to be wrong thoughts. Also, it had to be wrong feelings. So I believe wrong thoughts and feelings generate the cause and core of disease and that it is introduced into the physical body through the distortions in the electronic patterns. I don't doubt someday science may discover how to reach into these electronic patterns and adjust them. But I still believe that to have permanent healing, you have to correct the cause and core of the condition that made it in the first place. And the master said to me this morning, he said, this is the important thing to cause people to realize is that every single disease has its cause-effect relationship and it is a definite tie into karma. So I'm going to blend these two lectures into one, how to find total healing and understanding karma by pointing out, and I'm going to take the negative aspects of karma first, that negative karma, which means that you yourself did something to someone in the past that has not been balanced, 
will in many cases cause you to suffer some disease or state of mind and is probably one of the causes behind insanity. Now I would like to point out to you that obsessions are the cause of most insanity. I will give you an example. We will say that a husband marries a wife and they are getting along very beautifully and the mother-in-law becomes obsessed that her son is absolutely perfect and that the woman that he married is absolutely imperfect in every way. And the mother-in-law does not like her and she becomes obsessed with this idea until it is absolutely all she can talk about to her friends is the terrible girl that her son married. Now this woman can keep on in one embodiment just condemning and condemning and condemning this poor girl who in reality is probably a very decent person and if she were left alone would be even better. This woman then will pass on eventually and die, the older the mother-in-law. And when she goes out with a momentum of obsession, she probably will come back into embodiment with a schizophrenic condition, for example. She will have split her mind in two because a part of her is honest and knows that what she's saying and thinking about this girl has no basis in fact or justice. And the other part of her is obsessed with the idea, which is not true, that the girl does. I'm using this as an example. Many mental conditions are created by obsessions and warped conditions of outlook upon life, which are persisted in for a long period of time. And it is a well-known fact that people will fool themselves. And what insanity is, is pulling the wool over your own eyes for a period of years until after a while you do not know the difference between reality and unreality. So now I'm showing you the causes of insanity in a karmic effect, cause and effect relationship. I also believe that many physical conditions that people have have their cause and core relationship back into the past, in past embodiments. These are congenital defects. That is to say, the people were born with these conditions. However, I believe that seed tendencies, and by seed tendencies I mean seeds that have not sprouted, but they are ideas you have toyed with in past embodiments, are in you in a dormant state. Then I believe that you may at one time or another, through wrong thought or feeling against your neighbor or against yourself, against the universe or anything else, you may reactivate these seed tendencies and then they sprout and they gradually take root and the first thing you know we have the manifestation of disease. Now, if I put a plaster on your body and this plaster draws the poison out of you and you recover from your disease but the cause and core of that disease is not removed, that condition will reoccur because you've only temporarily relieved the condition by pulling out the poison. But the causes of that poison, the creation of that poison within the body, the poison creating agents are still there. Therefore, to find total healing, whether you're functioning through a chiropractor, a medical doctor, or whether you're functioning with a divine healer, or whether you're doing it yourself through prayer, or even if God descends to you and says unto you, Be thou whole. In order to find total healing, you have to be able to remove the cause and core of the condition because the cause and core, if they're unremoved, will regenerate the condition. And this is why Jesus said, go and sin no more lest the worst thing come upon you. Because if you leave the root down in there and you don't take it out, that condition is definitely going to come back upon you at a future time. It may not even manifest in this embodiment, but it will come back unless you've taken out the cause and core. Therefore, a lot of the people that go to divine healers, as well as those that go to doctors, are very ignorant people in many cases. They are looking for their healing in other conditions outside of themselves, and they are utterly failing to recognize that the healing is within their own selves, that they have the power to correct the condition the same as they had the power to establish the condition in the first place. It's the law of a man's own being that governs his healing. And this is why your mind can make you well. This is why 
through prayer you can be well. It's because you establish the conditions at one time or another and no one but you has the power to really turn the key. All the masters do, all the doctors do, all your own divine presence does is help you to release the energy of perfection within yourself which will alleviate the cause and core. But unless you do that, you're going to, of course, continue to have that and you may have a worse thing come upon you because if you don't remove the cause and core, that condition will recur and something worse may come in also. Now, if you will examine the people that go and follow all these great healers throughout the world, and I'm referring to men like Oral Roberts and that kind, you'll find that many of them, if you examine their life all the way through, many of those people were themselves no better than anyone else in the world. They did everything that you can think of. They drank and they smoked and they danced and they had a high old time and they got sick. They didn't even care about God. They got sick and that was the open door to their interest in religion. Because they were sick, they became frightened and fear, not love, was the motivating power that drove them to the doctor. Fear was the motivating power that drove them to the spiritual healer. Fear was the power that sent them to the evangelistic tents. They were afraid they were going to die and after death would come the judgment. And so it was fear that brought them to the feet of God and they said, oh, I'll do anything, anything if you'll only make me well. Many people have rushed to the various healers. They've been healed and as soon as the condition was alleviated, they have returned to the same old conditions and they couldn't care less about God until the next time when something happened again and then they got all interested right away in God. I've heard many stories of people who on their deathbed were ready to do anything to confess because they were afraid for themselves. This is merely self-interest, true self-interest. Interest in Almighty God, which is the perfect image up here, would cause mankind to understand this important point that the natural state of every man is absolute health. That is the natural God state. And a man or a woman or a child is intended to be wholly perfect and not to be imperfect in any way. But these conditions come about contrary to nature. Now everyone knows that some of the greatest spiritual souls have been ill. That's why I bring to your attention that you must understand karma to its fullest. You must understand that we have no right to judge anyone because they're sick or even because they're well. We shouldn't look at a well person and say this person is a saint because they're well. Because I'll never forget in my early life a man by the name of Putz Lazell. That was a very odd name and he was my family barber. I was having a haircut in Putz's chair one day and he said to me, you're sick. I said, well, I've had a little cold. He said, I've never been sick in my life. And he looked very well. His cheeks were bright red and I mean always the pink of health, a bright eye, strong, agile. So I said to him, well, I'm very glad to hear that. He said, no, I've never been sick. Well, I said, haven't you even had uh, the mumps? Nope, never had the mumps. Chicken pox? Nope, never had the chicken pox. Well, have you ever had a cold? Never had a cold in my life. I've never been sick a day in my life. Well, three days later, Putz Lazelle had a stroke. And he never, to my knowledge, ever walked again and he died two or three years later after being the rest of the time in a wheelchair. So you see, well people can also get sick and you can't say because someone's well that they're a saint and you can't say because someone gets sick that they're a sinner. I had a man tell me that one time when I had some kind of a, an affliction, I don't even know what it was. He said, you got bats in your belfry, that's the trouble with you. He and another spiritual man, they were both yogis, they were riding in the front seat of their big Cadillac and they were making fun of me while I was sitting in the rear. And it was over an oil deal. You see, they had been told by their yogic master that there was oil located in a certain place in the United States and they were spending $7,000 a day, I understand, to have it assayed. And I was there visiting. And they said, would you like to ride along up to this oil place? And I said, certainly. Well, we got up there and I looked down the hole and I w talked to Master Mori and Mori said, there isn't any oil in there except the little residual gas. But he said, there's no real oil down in and these men are wasting their money, so tell them so. So I told them and they laughed at me. 
Well, they laughed out of the other corner of their mouth after a while because they found out there wasn't any oil in there either. In the meantime, the men that were doing the assay from St. Louis, they were sitting there, these engineers, at the table, and I don't know why they took to me, but they all liked me. And they ignored the two millionaires that were with me and didn't hardly talk to them, and all they talked to was me. And that made these men very mad. So a little while later, we went out in the afternoon, and they had these one-mile, two-mile, three-mile, four-mile, five-mile, six-mile roads. And so the men said, well, the crew with the radio is at the six-mile road. And I said, no, they're at five-mile road. And they said, no, they're at six mile. They went to six mile road, went down that road, no crew. Well, they says they're at four mile road. They wouldn't go to five mile because I'd said that. <laughs> so they drove down four mile road and they weren't there and they went to three mile road and the guy said, well, let's go to one mile road. They went to one mile road. No, they weren't there. And the guy said, well, I know they're not at two mile road. They went up to five mile road and there they were, right where I told them. But they still said I had bats in my belfry. They also told me that because I was sick with something, I think it was probably a cold or some little thing, they said that I had a bad karma. They actually told me this. And one of the chilas who became a master in their work, one of the chilas who became a master, and he is a big-time operator in Washington, D.C., in the religious field, he met a man that came over from Europe who'd been in the State Department, doing diplomatic work, and he told that man, and he claimed to be a master, he said, your karma is so bad that there isn't any use whatsoever in you even trying to be good in this life because you won't make any improvement at all. And the man was on the verge of suicide. And he came to me and I told him, I said, that man is ridiculous. So it was a terrible thing. It was a perfectly terrible thing. And this was up in Detroit where this happened. And a very interesting thing while we're on the subject is this. One of these millionaires had an airplane. And so he picked me up in Madison, Wisconsin to fly me over to Detroit to a convention over there they were having. And when I got on the plane, we hadn't been airborne very long over the Great Lakes before it came to me very clearly that we were going to have an awful storm. Master Moria told me, he said, they're going to have a terrible, terrible storm you're going to get into up there. So all at once, the uh, sky began to get black. So I told him, I said, Master Moria told me we're going to have a terrible storm. He said, don't worry about it. He says, my master told me in meditation this morning that we were going to have clear weather all the way. So I said, well, that's fine. I hope you're right. I don't want to be right. The next thing you know, the Lone Rock Radio came on. It says, Lone Rock Radio, warning to all aircraft in the vicinity of the Great Lakes, Severe turbulence, winds up to 70 or 80 miles an hour. I reached down to fasten my seatbelt, and I never did get it fastened. I landed on the ceiling of the plane. The next thing you know, I was down. And the wings were going like this, and I was praying. The woman was knitting in the back. She's <laughs> knitting, you know. And uh, she kept on knitting, and I started, I says, Oh, God, I says, take command of this airplane. And when I said that, she dropped her knitting, and she looked out, and she saw that there was nothing you could see anywhere. It was all white and black and the hail was hitting the nose of the plane and the thing was going up and down you couldn't see anywhere so I kept on praying and he says to me be still he said and get calm he said don't be afraid I said well I'm just making calls so I started praying I kept on praying all at once a little spot as bright as a gold piece appeared in the sky and down way down below you could see the fields of Indiana through that little hole and he and I we spiraled down in that plane we went down through that hole and we came out over the Indiana and we were in perfect condition so we flew on into Detroit and we landed and as soon as we got on the street we went out to buy some fruit we're walking down the street and then the cyclone and tornado hit right in that area there and we got all soaked and drenched on the street so I said that's once in my life I've been hit twice by the same tornado <laughs> so you have to understand that human opinion of karma is a very dangerous practice to engage in you have to understand that if we didn't have a lot of karma in this world, none of the people would be here because karma is the ballast that ties this balloon of, of the mighty soul of man that is tied to the God presence down. There's so much power in your divine presence up here that if you didn't have the karmic conditions down here that are acting as ballast, this gondola car would have long ago gone up into the atmosphere in the ascension. And the whole problem then of disease and karma and everything is that which keeps us 
down to the round of earth life. And most of the people do not know this, and they are blind. They're like, I was flying blind up there with this man and couldn't see where we were going. That's the way the people are. They live according to a dogma and a theology which is called either Buddhist or Christian doctrine or it's called Mohammedanism. In other words, the many religions of the world are actually palliative. They take this little pill of their particular brand of religion and they decide that that is enough to get them to Valhalla. And they don't realize that they're going to be reborn. They don't realize that cause and effect enters into this. They go through life completely ignorant of it. If they do happen to, as Emerson pointed out, if they happen to read some of these things about Brahma, which he said, by the way, you can also call God if you can't understand what Brahma is. When they do read this, they go to their pastor, and what does the pastor say? Oh, he said, stay away from that heathenish doctrine. Do you want to go to hell? Well, he doesn't tell them that they're already in it. <laughs> and the only way they can get out of it is to find perfection. The ancient Hindus, the heathens that they're talking about, knew more about this than they know about it. And this is an absolute fact. And if they could have a personal conversation with Jesus Christ right now and talk to him the way you and I can talk back and forth, he would be the first divine person to set them straight on what these facts are. But people have ideas and they think their ideas are right because they're supported by a large number of people. But they have never had contact with the masters. Most of them haven't even had contact with the Holy Spirit. Most of them haven't had any contact with their own divine presence. Oh, they pray. They're like the little boy that kneels by his bed and says, Now I lay me down to sleep. Which is all right. It's very sweet. But we have to get beyond that point. We have to get to know our God in order to find total healing. Because the source of that total healing is knowing God and drawing God down all around you. That's the permanent method of healing. Now, the Summit Lighthouse does not have anything against the practice of divine healing. And we have worked a long time along these lines. We had a healing service in Washington one time, and quite a few people claimed they received healing through that service. We're for it. But I don't believe, and the great masters don't believe, that we should just go out and heal the body without giving total healing to mankind. Because you can heal the body, so the body lives a few more years. But unless it's doing better than it did, unless the person is trying to find some of their own reality and gain and go up instead of just hold their status quo, all they are is a vegetable. A vegetable sits there in the soil and draws out nutrients, and it grows and expands its physical appearance self. And if that's all people are doing is drawing energy, raising children, the children are raising children, and the children's children are raising children, I mean, all you're doing is having generation. But what is the cycle of generation? Sure, we can keep re-embodying, and because of the cycle of generation, we can be assured that for the next million years we'll always be coming back here and be able to do the same things we're doing now. Rather monotonous, isn't it? The idea that you have to be reborn put into diapers and pinned up and have oatmeal gruel dribbling down your chin and then learn to walk all over again, have your grandparents and people standing there, oh, isn't he cute? <laughs> this goes on and on and on. So we look forward to this for a million years. I think it must be a little revolting to the masters, especially in their last embodiment when they realize with all the great intelligence they have and all their nearness to God that they have to come back the last time before their ascension and go through this process. But to do it for a million years more, that would be terrific. Because there isn't anything that we're going to do a million years from now on the human level that we're not doing now, you see. What are we going to do? Go back to Grandpa's day. Grandpa, he had a horse and buggy and a buggy whip. He reached over and he whipped his horses to make them go faster. Now we don't even have to whip the horses. All we have to do is put our foot down a little harder on the accelerator and we can murder our neighbors with our automobile. And this is what they're doing in Colorado at the rate of about 300 a year. So drive careful in this state. I'm just telling you these things. 
because they're absolutely true and they are related to the condition of karma. Karma is what keeps us here. However, good karma is what? Ten o'clock. My karma has run out on me. <laughs> to finish this up, I'll just try to recap on the body. You have the body. In the body, interpenetrating the body, is the emotional body, which is like the water in the sponge. And that's pulled by moon substance. And the moon in Latin is luna. And during the cycle of the full moon, a lot of people get a little cuckoo and they become somewhat like lunatics. And that's because of the pull on the water element in the physical body. That's the same effect that the moon has on the tides. It's the gravitational pull of the moon substance. And of course, if this gets a hold of you enough, it pulls the emotional body to the point out of distortion where it doesn't go back or snap back into place when the moon influences are gone but it stays distended and then maybe just before the next cycle of the moon it starts to go back but immediately it's pulled out again. So you have that and then you have the mental body which is interpenetrating the flesh form and you have the etheric body which interpenetrates that also and therefore in a sense the Akashic records of your personal world are while you're in embodiment actually right with you wherever you go, you see. But a certain amount of this is, of course, in the higher mental body. That is, I mean to say there's a contact or connection between the higher mental body and the lower etheric body. There's bound to be a connection because the higher mental body is able to know exactly the errors you've made and mistakes and can tell you how to correct those mistakes. So it wouldn't be a bad idea in finding total healing if you get to talk a little bit to your higher mental body, your Holy Christ Self, which we call it in this activity more the Holy Christ Self, if you talk a little more to your Holy Christ self and get acquainted with this universal focus of the universal Christ, it's a focus of the universal Christ individualized for you. And this is the mediator between your God presence up here, which is totally perfect, and your human self down here, which is certainly not. And therefore, you can find the way to be raised up to your God presence, and then you have total healing. And anything less than that is only palliative, temporary, and it's good as long as it lasts. If you want something permanent, you get the total integration of your God self and you've got all the healing you need. Do you think Jesus was ever sick? No. I find no record of it in Akasha. I find no record of it in the scriptures. I have never found any record anywhere of Jesus being sick. I think maybe that's why they called him the master of masters <laughs> because he was really a master of every situation. Now, he told us himself, the things I do you can do and greater things. Just because yesterday you didn't doesn't mean you can't do it tomorrow or today. So let's build our faith. Let's use our knowledge. Let's not condemn anyone. The Master didn't. And we will find our total healing in due course of time. When the fullness of the time was come, then, you see, the perfect Son was brought forth. And the perfect Son of God within you will be brought forth in the fullness of time. And in order to bring time to its fullness, we have to do our part. And every act and thought that we do that simulates the divine acts of creation brings about the birth of the perfect Son of God within. So let us know that that is the greatest and most wonderful permanent source of healing for the whole world. I thank you.